Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to what's now episode eight of our uh, FRG lockdown webinar series. Uh, I'll be pleased to introduce you to one of our regular SRMC speakers, um, independent film and documentary maker, Emil Geeson. Um, we're going to be talking a bit today about um, fake news and propaganda, something that Emil's come across a lot in his time, sort of producing documentaries and, and getting his, his uh, stuff out there. Uh, same routine as normal. Please do fire your questions in. Uh, we'll fill them all at the end and I'll, I'll ask them over to, to Emil to make it easier, but do pre, uh, please do that. Those who haven't been on Zoom regularly, just hover over the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to get to the Q&A box and just type your questions in. Um, but without further ado, let me hand you over to Emil. Hi, Frank. thanks, thanks. Cheers, mate, mate. Hi, everyone. So, it's a new time as webinars. It's not exactly the same without having an audience there. I feel a bit of, a, a bit of an idiot. But let's crack on anyway. So hopefully it works. So what is propaganda and fake news disinformation? It's, it's something that's been around for years. It's nothing new. It's the terminology slightly changed. Um, just look at this post here. Imagine if this guy becomes the next president of the United States of America, from Trump to Joe Exotic. Mental. It's the times that we're living in now where the social media um, ecosystem of information is, there's so much information out there, we're bombarded with it. But where did it start from and where... How do we get to where we are now with fake news and disinformation? Propaganda. Propaganda is not really a word we like to use anymore. It's, it's dated. When I, if I was to say to you, close your eyes and think of propaganda, the majority of you would probably start thinking of the First World War and the Second World War. But really, misinformation, which we'll go into a bit more depth in a bit, disinformation and propaganda really go hand in hand. It's just a terminology people don't like using anymore. If we were to talk about Boris Johnson, Corona, and start saying propaganda, people will be like, it's a bit old school, wherefore the terminology is fake news. And we, we expand on that a bit later. So what is propaganda? Have a little read of that. Information, especially of a biased or misleading nature, used to promote a political cause and a point of view, both positive and negative. Propaganda is a negative word. Most of us will say propaganda, that's, that's a negative, but really, for governments, it can be used in a positive way to have influence across the, the population, the majority. Some here, these, so when we talk about the Second World War propaganda, we go to the Second World War because it really started, propaganda originated, they claim, in the 1600s with the Catholic Church to when they were trying to spread um, Christianity across the world. They were using it to spread their message. So it was through word of mouth before we had digital media, print media and television. But if we go to the Second World War and look at these images here, these posters, which are quite famous posters, and you probably recognize all of them, is what were they trying to achieve with the posters during the war, for example? It was simple as to influence people to get behind the war campaign to fight Nazi Germany. But on the flip side, the Nazis were clearly using propaganda to incite the fact that um, the rise of Nazism against the West, against invading the Czech um, into Poland and further across into Europe. It was manipulation of information to the masses. Simple as that. But what is propaganda in a sense? What are they trying to achieve? The main thing they're trying to achieve is emotion. They're trying to get you to believe in a cause that they want you to believe in. And it's very much the same as what we're doing now, or what people are doing now with fake news. So wartime propaganda, we, we, when we talk about propaganda, we would generally associate it with war, as we're saying there, um, the Second World War, the First World War and stuff. But what is wartime propaganda? It's a weapon to win public support. If you win the space of information, you can potentially win the war. If you don't control the space, the narrative, the rhetoric, you don't have um, the support of the majority. And if governments for war campaigns don't have the majority of the public, like we saw in Afghanistan towards the end of the campaign, the, um, the public weren't behind the actual war effort and it slowly um, divided off. And we saw that actually myself being on the front line in Afghanistan is when they were changing the narrative in parliament, we saw an impact on the ground because the public weren't supporting the war anymore and the government had to find a way out. So if they win the support through the narrative, they can continue with their campaign or whatever they're trying to influence. The ability to win public support is just as important as the war, as I just mentioned there. 
is owning the space and owning the narrative. And major influence in many, if not all major wars. It's been throughout time, all wars have been influenced through the propaganda. We could even go back to the Crusaders, for example, and word of mouth, the storytelling of the propaganda, the Chinese whispers of East versus West. So it hasn't always just been through the medium of prints and um, television and such. It's, it's been there um, for years, for centuries through word of mouth. So media propaganda, how do they work? So it's not just governments that are trying to control the narrative and living in a democracy, we live with freedom of press as such. But of course there is influence through propaganda for the media because the media, depending on the outlet, do have an agenda, what they're trying to achieve. What is their narrative? What is the rhetoric they want to get across to their target audience? Is that in support of a government? Is it in support of shareholders? Is it in support of anyone, corporates or um, as such? So the media propaganda, it's a persuasion of a further agenda, like saying there, they want to get a message across. For example, the narrative of the Daily Express in the UK is very different to the narrative of the Guardian. What are they trying to persuade the public with their agenda, with the kind of stories they're telling? They want to stir up emotions against a political, personal business agenda. This is, we, we're seeing it now, we, we saw it during Brexit, we saw it through the 2016 um, elections in America campaign, we've seen it through Corona. What are they trying to stir up? And you've probably seen after Boris Johnson's um, changed the lockdown procedure on Sunday slightly, the morning headlines were very different from the Daily Mirror to what the Sun was saying, as in what is their political agenda? Where do they sit? If they sit right or they sit left? is who they're trying to persuade here and what is their business agenda as well as personal. An influence of facts to encourage particular perception. Totally, and we'll talk about this in a bit, we could talk about the second Gulf War in 2003, is what facts are they using to encourage you to get an emotional support behind an agenda they want to achieve. So we are saying there about um, propaganda, but like I was saying, it's a very negative um, word these days, and we're more used to fake news. And it was mainly coined by Donald Trump. And people that know me through social media is when I'm speaking out about things, a lot of American audience and people that follow me try to bash me, say I'm a, I'm a President Trump um, hater, for example. It's not, it's just the fact is, Donald Trump is very good for narrative. For media outlets, he's a gift. If it probably wasn't for um, Donald Trump getting into power, many American uh, media outlets and press would probably have gone because it's the fact is that he's so stimulating in conversation. He's a character and he provides a lot of headlines, which we'll talk about in a bit. But fake news was coined really by Donald Trump in the sense that anyone who didn't agree to his narrative is fake news. And that's quite dangerous. And we'll explain a bit why. So let's talk about them in this in this space that we operate now, we don't really tr we try not we try to get away with propaganda, but we what we have now is misinformation and disinformation, and they're very different and um, malinformation. So misinformation, let's give an example. Misinformation would be like the other day I stood in the queue to go into Barclays Bank and two meter social distancing. The woman behind me was on the phone and she was talking to someone, and she was talking about the deaths, how many people have died. And she came out with a figure saying it was terrible. I was over hearing. And the guy who was behind her turned around while she's on the phone and corrected her, saying, no, it's not 24,000, it's 32,000. So he was trying to correct her with information. That is inf misinformation. It's information that's out there that he's just misheard or his Chinese whispers that he's trying to pass on. He isn't doing it intentionally to provide her with disinformation. Disinformation is information, for example, that I'm telling you something that I know is totally wrong and I want you to spread that information. If I was to then tell you, for example, uh, it could be anything out there. If I was to tell you now that all shops are now gonna open tomorrow and the lockdown is over, that's disinformation I'm giving to you. If you're then to pass that information on to someone else, that'd be misinformation as such. And our information is when you intentionally try to discredit people governments, uh, organizations with that information in a harmful way. So is misinformation as dangerous as disinformation? No, because it's people that are sharing it, but overall you could say yes, because it's spreading that disinformation from the source to the population. 
just over here some there disinformation is information to blur the lines between between reality and fiction and that's what I'm, if i was sat here and i want to get information out there this is disinformation all i'm trying to do is cloud your judgment to know what's real and what's fake um and like you're saying say a lie a thousand times it soon becomes the truth and that 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 could be in the facts is you could people could be saying to me you're fat Emil. you're fat you're fat you're fat and after a while people will start thinking yeah i'm actually fat in that kind of simplistic way is that you're trying to get it across there and it comes from several sources the same bit of information and you're going okay well i've heard that from x y and z over there it's got to be true because it's been said so many times and what we've seen this on saying it a thousand times very much in the Trump campaign is Hillary a crook, emails, 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 crook, emails, emails, crook. After a while, the audience start believing that's the only narrative they're hearing. That's got to be true. It's been said so many times. There's no other truth. There. It is the truth because it's been said so many times. So say a lie a thousand times, it soon becomes the truth. And we'll talk a bit about the war in Ukraine and how Russia have used that to their advantage. Repetition is the name of the game. The more it's repeated, the more it comes real. And that's really um, hand in glove with the one before. Repeat, repeat, repeat. And it's got to be true, hasn't it? Because I'm saying it continuously, which isn't always the case. And like I was saying there, it blurs the lines between what is real and what is fake. Have a look at that. A lie is halfway around the world before the truth is booked, um, had time to put its boots on with a picture of Churchill. So what that's saying is, you think about a lie. If I'm going to tell a lie to you, a lie is juicy. It's, think of a takeaway. It's a kebab. It's a doner kebab meat. Yeah, I like food, as you can tell. It's, it's juicy. It's like, oh, I shouldn't be really having this, but I'm going to share it. I'm going to have it. I'm going to have a go. Think of the truth as being a carrot stick. It's, they're both food sources, of course, but the carrot stick isn't as interesting as the the kebab, of course. And that's what lies and truth are, is if I can say to you, it's really sunny outside today, you'd be like, yeah, it's really sunny, yeah, good, it's nice. If I was to say to you, there's gonna be a storm coming and the storm's coming and potentially it could be like some aliens that come down to, the, down to earth with it as well. It's a lie, but it's more interesting, isn't it? So I'm more likely to tell someone else the lie. That was really, that's a massive exaggeration. But the fact is that a lie is more juicy than the truth. So they get spread very quickly because people know, well, that's the truth. That's boring. It's like, I'm not going to share it. But if you're looking at this screen here now with Churchill here, clearly what I've done there is I put a picture of Churchill next to that quote. So I'm now trying to give you some disinformation or a half truth to say more than likely Churchill said that, which isn't the case. It's just a picture of Churchill I put there. But that's another way of manipulation, which we'll talk, go into a little bit more depth about how you can give a message to someone by giving them the half truth. I'm not misleading you, I'm not lying to you. I've just put a picture of Churchill there. And some of you probably believe that was a Churchill quote, which is not. So let's talk about narrative then. So let's go back to the propaganda. And now let's talk about 1940 Dunkirk, the evacuation of 338,000 British troops from the beaches of Dunkirk. If you look at the picture on the left, we surround you. The British spirit, they're there fighting to the end. So what they've done is they didn't have a, enough ships. So they went to local fishermen and said, right, who's got a boat? Let's get over across Dunkirk. British spirit, let's get our soldiers home. Before you know it, thousands of little boats, little small um, pleasure crafts, fishing boats, sailed across to pick up our soldiers who were on the fighting on the beaches of um, Dunkirk. Wow. Um, th there was a, a film, Dunkirk, with um, Harry Styles and such, and it. Brilliant. What we've done there is we've taken a, a defeat and turned it into a victory by changing the narrative. And that's what cleverly countries do. And um, they, they've done it for years. And very much there is Dunkirk was a defeat. We had an embarrassment of thousands of soldiers sat on a beach who were surrounded by the, the Germans. We, our soldiers were there after the First World War to defeat, um, who defeated the Germans. And now all of a sudden our soldiers are surrounded by the Nazis and are gonna be obliterated. So the narrative really is, victory rescue campaign brave soldiers you've taken them the narrative that could have been a negative of surrender defeat to a positive go and get our boys home and it's very clever in the sense to keep the war effort going the spirit of the troops as well as the spirit of the the morale of the people is to turn a negative into a positive 
And that's where propaganda comes into the sense that it's not disinformation. They're not lying to you. They're just changing the rhetoric, changing the narrative and how they tell you about it. And they've done it throughout time as governments. Here's another example, Operation Bodyguard in 1944, which was the lead up to the Normandy landings, D-Day, and the war of propaganda. And this was the, uh, the biggest campaign the Brits and Americans and the Canadians had launched in propaganda, disinformation against the Germans, or where the invasion was going to come. And the war, the, the um, landings of Normandy were only successful due to their campaign of propaganda. It was controlling the airwaves, the message and the narrative that was spread out through the radio, the information that was passed on by people in pubs where there was potentially German spies listening, um, the press, information of locations of people, where's Rommel, where's um, these American commanders, what part of the country are they in, where, did, where they like to attack, information that was in, um, passed through Soviet spies back into Spanish spies, the disinformation to confuse the Germans. So when the Operation D, they went in, there was such a massive campaign of propaganda that they didn't believe that the main assaulting force was coming through Normandy. And that's another way, another um, angle where propaganda has been used to the advantage of us. Um, the disinformation of sending that narrative out there to control the narrative and the rhetoric. So they think, right, they're not coming here. This is a, this is a um, decoy. They're gonna be coming from Calais. So it's been used effectively by the British for centuries. KGB 1980s HIV um, AIDS campaign. I don't know if you've heard of this one, Operation Infection. And what this was, was and even today, I was, it was only uh, yesterday, I, was, uh, I don't listen to rap normally, it's not my thing, but um, rap music. And there was a rapper and he was talking about the CIA and Americans and AIDS trying to get rid of blacks and homosexuals through prison and stuff like this. But really, AIDS and HIV wasn't people would so you 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 would find someone now who would tell you it's an American conspiracy that Americans um, wanted to get rid of homosexuals and blacks. It's clearly not the case. It's a massive smear campaign by the KGB and the Soviets to discredit America. So why would they want to do that? Why would you make up HIV, a disease that's spreading, to influence your um, foreign agenda? So what did the Soviets get out of um, Operation Infection? So the desire to undermine US um, credibility. The fact is, if you're gonna, if you, I'm now all the Soviets who are trying to discredit the Americans across the world during the Cold War, is if I'm telling you, if I'm telling people that you're likely to spread an infection amongst your own population, your own nationals, to get rid of people, to kill the masses or the minority as such, what are you gonna be doing to the enemy? If you're going to do that to your own, what are you likely to do to us? So it's a double-edged weapon for them. It's to undermine the American narrative at that time. Once again, to foster anti-Americanism. Um, obviously, with the Cold War, with a lot of influence in, in Europe, in South America, in the Middle East, in the Far East, is to get this message across once again, to discredit them. Um, so people start thinking, America is quite a bad nation here. They're, they're spreading viruses amongst their own. Isolate America abroad. Once again, it's because of the Cold War, like we're saying there, it's that influence they were having. And to create tension between host nations, the Cold War was very much about East versus West and who controlled what and where and between the Soviets and Americas. By making the lies up, by dis um, disinformation campaigns on a large scale like this, um, it spreads and it fosters this um, anti-Americanism. And like I was saying there, even today, people will still say that HIV and AIDS was created by the USA. And this was started as a disinformation campaign back in the 80s. And still now, 40 years on, it's still going around. And it just shows how influential certain campaigns and certain disinformation can get caught up into our society. That people don't want to know the truth. They don't care about the truth. They've heard it and now they believe it because they've heard it a thousand times. And another reason why they would do, potentially do this campaign was to distract attention from their own um, biological weapons um, campaign. If I say that you're spreading viruses around the world while I'm trying to do something similar, is the message is the, the lights on you. It's very much like we could say, like a, a couple that's cheating, a partner that's cheating, to say the husband's cheating on the wife, and what he's doing, he can, he's always going on to it. You're cheating, you're cheating, cheating. Really, it's him that's cheating. He's trying to deflect the information, what, what he's up to onto the other person. And as the Cold War era was a massive campaign 
of um, disinformation between the two nations and also the proxies that were involved. So moving forward now to 2003, something that I, I was involved in, in fact, was the invasion of Iraq and the misinformation, disinformation campaign that was surrounded by it. Excuse me. The lead up to the war, I, I was, well, my maths is pretty bad, so I was probably about 19. Obviously went over, had our anthrax injections, and then moved over to Kuwait to sit in the desert, waiting for the orders to cross the border into Iraq in um, March 2003. The build up to the war, was the, the narrative of 45 minutes to danger from attack. Um, Saddam Hussein's got weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons. If we don't do something about it, he will use them against us. They were controlling through the media, governments were controlling through the media, the narrative that was told to the individuals to, 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 um, to get this emotion out there, people that he's a dangerous. The clever thing about 2003, the invasion is, Obviously, in September 2001, we had 9-11, and that was an attack on American soils, soil, which brought a lot of countries into the war on terror. And the narrative on the war on terror played very cleverly for the invasion of Iraq. The narrative of Arab, brown man, Middle East danger. And it was the fact is the spread of information and disinformation that people generally rolled from the 9-11 the attacks, Afghanistan, quite happily, into Iraq to go right there is a threat there was no credible information this was a government that lied to us about the reasons we were going to war there was no weapons of mass destruction um, you also you've got people with massive conspiracy theories that would tell you yes they were found uh, they weren't ever found they would never disclose large-scale weapons of mass destruction chemical weapons uh, we were led into war in 2003 or based on lies and it was because the rhetoric that was coming out through the mainstream media, the disinformation war, controlled that space to allow the public to get behind an invasion of Iraq, which kills millions of people and still having its knock on effect to this day in Iraq, um, leading on to Syria as well, potentially. So it is the fact is that who controls what? Does the government control the narrative or do the media control the way governments operate? The way you've got to look at it as well is every morning, Every politician across the world, every leader, every influential person sits down and reads the headlines to a newspaper. Is what is more powerful? Is it the newspapers that print the stories, the editors who control what they're writing, or is it the governments? And when you're living in a democracy, when you've got freedom of information and freedom of press, really it's very dangerous in the sense that the people that control the media, who control the information space, the information that's going to us as the public, can make and break governments in the sense that are governments working hand in hand with the media or are they against them? And you can tell that by the different outlets and who organises what and what is their political agenda. It's, it's very interesting in the sense that it is a powerful tool that can make and break governments. And here in 2003, we saw the invasion of Iraq, which um, I'm saying as a guy who invaded Iraq as a young Marine, we shouldn't have done. And it's because the amount of disinformation. I'm not saying everyone agreed with the war. There were millions of people throughout the world who said we should be going to war. So let's talk about um, Ukraine, something that's quite close to my heart. It is a beautiful country, Ukraine. Really like Ukraine. Um, 2014 with the annexing of Crimea is the Russians where the Soviets and now the Russians are experts leading experts in disinformation controlling that space of what information is passed out to you and what we believe you think about it I'm not saying it's just Russia because the UK America China Saudi Arabia and many other nations around the world are very influential and um, key players within um, the the disinformation space of fake news. But the Russians play it very cleverly in the sense that, say it a thousand times, it becomes the truth. So all of a sudden, um, Putin played to deny again. So the annex of Crimea. So the people of Crimea, they had a, an election where the people wanted to become part of Russia. It used to be part of Russia many years ago, in a nutshell. And excuse anyone here who's an expert in Russian and Ukrainian affairs. But in a nutshell, in layman's terms, is all of a sudden, there was an uprising. Loads of little green men, as they were called, soldiers with no bandages on, turn up in, in um, Crimea, and Crimea now part of Russia. All of a sudden, Putin now, this is in Europe, yeah? Putin all of a sudden goes, you've got soldiers in Ukraine, in Crimea, you've annexed it. No, we haven't. We haven't got soldiers there. 
where, where are they Russian soldiers? He's denied it straight away. Then it was the narrative changed to, well, some of them might be soldiers that want to be part of, that want Crimea, they're, they're off duty soldiers. They're not working, they've on their leave, they've gone over to Crimea to liberate it as such. I don't control them, they're on their leave. Then the narrative changed goes, well, they might be soldiers, but they're not, they're not official government soldiers, they're militia soldiers, they're not our soldiers. The narrative kept on changing, the information he kept on saying just kept on lying and lying and lying. And how it was proven that they were actual Russian soldiers was a lot of these soldiers were doing selfies on the phone. So it was getting geo-locked in the sense that who they were, linking to where this soldier was, what time he was there, what location, what unit he belonged to. That there was no doubt that these little green men were Russian soldiers, just without badges. And it was very cleverly played by Putin in the sense that he had invaded the land, he had taken occupation of, a, of the Crimea and Peninsula and just denied it. And no one, no one around the world really said anything to him. It was like... Well, hold on a second, what are you doing? But they're not our soldiers, they're not Russians. These are the simple people that want to be part of Russia. It's nothing to do with me. Well, they might be Russians. The fact is that he kept on telling lie after lie after lie. He was controlling the narrative that before you know it, no one opposed it. And Crimea became part of Russia just by telling simple lie after lie after lie. Also going back to the Ukraine war is the shooting down of MH17 which was a passenger jet that came out of um, Amsterdam on its way to Malaysia and it was shot down. This is another classic disinformation campaign that the Russians played very cle cleverly. It was shot down by a book, a uh, service to air missile. It was part of the Russians that were in Eastern Ukraine. People that support the Russian side of the campaign were totally dismissive. They would defunk it saying it was a Ukrainian fighter jet that shot this plane, but the evidence leans very heavily towards the fact a service to air missile system shot down this passenger jet killing hundreds of people so what happened is plane been blown up it's hit the floor what's going on now is who's to blame russia's like we've got nothing to do with this ukraine is like well i mean it's over our land civilians being killed here you're responsible for it the information war started so what america what the russians started to do was just sending information out they didn't care what information they were sending out. It was just some const, constant content of information. Lies across the board. The lie after lie after lie. Well, boom, we weren't there. This was here. This was there. This moved there. There was, there was so much information. They controlled the space that no one knew what was true and what was fake. There were so many fake stories that people are like, yeah, of course they're fake stories. But where is the truth hidden amongst the fake stories? That in the end, um, independence... Um, investigations and also the Dutch investigation has put it down to the fact is that it was a Russian book anti-aircraft anti um, service air missile that shot it down and they've got geotagging um, locations of the vehicle coming into Ukraine and then moving back out of Ukraine after the incident that happened but Putin tried to own that information space by going not as this is the information here it is they even got caught in one of their press off um, things photoshopping and um, photoshopping satellite um, pictures of clouds adding clouds in there and it's just like what are you doing why and it, they didn't care it's just like throw that information out there you sort out what's true and what's not it's not our job we we'll just give you the content you deal with it and like i was saying there it was a very clever move in the sense of to deflect going not us so fire hosing, what is this? Like saying there, and I don't want to keep smashing on that it's only the Russians that do this because the Russians do it very heavily. Of course they do, there's no dispute in that. But also many other nations around the world do it. Fire hosing, like I'm saying, is this high volume of information to send out. It's out there. Send it out there, you deal with it, you sort it out, you decide what's real and what's not. It's not my job, I'm just the person that's giving it to you. High volume information. Rapid, continuous and repetitive. Like I was saying, I've told, I mentioned earlier, is if I was to go out, walk down the road, Mrs. Jones says to me, uh, the lockdown's over. Then I walk further along the road and the guy, Matthew, goes, lockdown's over. I hear it from several different sources. It's got to be true. There's so many people talking about it. It's constant. It's repetitive. It's got to be true. And no commitment to objective reality. And like, like, like I was saying there, it's just doesn't have to be true. Don't have to be objective. I'm just, I'm telling you that's happened. Subjective views, you deal with that over it. And no commitment to consistency. And the fact is that it's just loads of different stories just thrown out there. And when you, if you talk about the 2006 election, 
on owning the information space with disinformation when it comes to Trump is when it came to Trump, there were so many different stories, racist, um, Mexican border, uh, in the sense that he was going to do this, that, and I think there was so many little sub stories that when it came to online content is it never channeled you directly into something. Before, when it comes to Hillary Clinton, the email scandals, the crook, emails, emails, emails. It was a lot of information on one particular story, which through the um, search engine, through SEO, would rank higher. The fact is that that's got to be true because it's there so much. But for the Trump stories, I hear there and everywhere. There's so much of it. Um, to sending out that content. And we'll talk about, it, about how that content gets out there. So PSYOPs. Let's talk about PSYOPs. So PSYOPs are psychological warfare operations by the military. Excuse me. Um, this is, once again, it's to control the narrative that, for example, right, Afghanistan. So, where was it? 2002, up in the mountains of Afghanistan, on the border of Pakistan, um, the Australian SAS got contacted. We got quickly told, right, get on the helicopters, go and reinforce them, support them in, in blocking positions um, for AQ that's moving around. So we fly out, got told 36 hours on the ground, maximum. So we fly out into the mountains, jump out into our position, start searching for the enemy. And all of a sudden, 36 hours turns into five days, six days. We didn't have enough rations with us, water. We're collecting rainwater to survive and everything. Um, and it comes to a stage where we're on the radio back to Camp Bagram and we're saying, well, we need a resupply of food and water quite urgently. We've been on the ground. We've only got X amount left. And 12 hours later, a helicopter Chinook flew in, rigid landing, came in, tailgate come down they don't even land they just sat, sat there and doors opened and they just threw out loads of boxes so we're like happy days food and water helicopter off it goes once we open the boxes they'll fill of cigarettes and wind up radios and that was part of the psychological the psyops war that they're passing out it's like what about us we're needing food and water here we don't care about cigarettes we can't eat them and what are we going to do with the radios so what it was was the message was, was pan these out to the locals so what psyops is essentially like you see in the pictures is Controlling the space of information that you give to the people in an occupying country or a country that you're trying to liberate, for example. The information that AQ, ISIS, um, all the, tal the Taliban, the bad guys are bad. We're the good guys. Listen, here, here's the radio. Listen to the stories that we control. Listen to the information that we're telling you. This is the information that's good. The information you get from the bad guys is bad information. So it's very heavily played by the military, even today, controlling um, online content that's given out to certain countries to have influence there, um, the press. And even there, you see the little picture of the little boy with the simple terms, a helicopter, soldier, shaking hands. It could be as simple as that. Um, I remember, in fact, I've got some little posters floating around. Well, we used to hand out in Iraq and in Afghanistan of little soldiers going, we're good guys with a hand on our chest. Um, weren't so good when we're putting down 50 cal rounds everywhere, javelins, trying to control the area against the Taliban as such. But yeah, psychological warfare through information is a war in itself. Control the, the war by, inf control the information war, you can then potentially win the actual war and the campaign. It's not just governments that you've been using propaganda and disinformation, it's, it's terrorist groups. And they've, they've, since the, the rise of social media and the internet has become massive for um, the difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS, in the sense that AQ bin Laden was a man in a cave with a shaky camera um, going, come on, we're going to go fight the infidels. ISIS flipped that on the heads and go on to their foot soldiers. Look at this video. Look how great it is here. Look at the way we've set up our cameras, our lighting, these are good Hollywood videos. You could be the guy that goes out and does this. So they control the information that they were given. Same as my documentary filmmaking um, with the, the volunteers that went to fight with the Kurds and to go fight with the Ukrainians. Once again, it's that disinformation through the internet that people are getting that and going, right, I want to go do that because that looks good. Um, they're saying a the war against these people, these bad guys, um, I want to be part of it. It is. Once again, the terrorist organizations are using disinformation for their recruitment tools and it's been very effective over the years, especially with Islamic State, who have really done well in getting their message across to young potential um, jihadis that, weren't, that probably wouldn't have gone over to join the caliphate, but they were talked into it through the disinformation campaign in the sense that the British and Americans who are killing Muslims come over to fight for Islam. They're not representing Islam at all, but the disinformation, the propaganda they were sending to these individuals sat in their bedroom through YouTube, through um, other sources, 
got sent thousands of men from around the world to join the caliphate in Iraq and Syria. So it's not just governments, it's organizations. This is quite an interesting one, actually, Pizzagate. So, um, I don't know if many people know about it because I love pizza. Some of you know this, yeah? So anything to do with pizza, I'm all over it. So um, Pizzagate, the Clinton campaign, which is still even today very re and relevant. It was 2016. So what happened is Clinton's campaign manager had his emails hacked. Um, standard practice, the email hacking um, scandal again. His emails were linked to a guy who owns um, Cosmet Pizza. It was um, Comet, sorry, Comet Pizza. It was linked to um, on WikiLeaks. Speculations about the pizza place head, was a headquarters for a pedophile ring. Um, I don't know where that came came through conspiracy theorists, uh, people that are trying to discredit malinformation towards the Clinton campaign. That all of a sudden now you've got staff at this restaurant that are getting abused online, um, verbally. Um, and in, in, in a restaurant, and it came to the pinnacle in the sense that a guy walked in with an assault rifle and opened fire, and luckily didn't kill anyone, but was arrested. And the reason he'd done that, he traveled miles to get there to Washington DC to open up, because he believed that that pizza restaurant was linked to the Clintons and was a headquarters for a pedophile ring. How, did you, how do you get that little bit of information on emails being hacked, information released, Clinton pedophiles, pizza shop shooting it's crazy but that's how the space is controlled by people with disinformation and even today which is four years after this incident people will still be repeating about the clintons and pedophile rings that the clintons are in charge of mass movement of children exploitation around the world there's no evidence to support this at all it is people that are spreading disinformation and it's like the operation infection we were talking about in the 80s with the kgb even today, that, that information is still out in our domain, that people still believe that from 40 years ago. And that's how effective um, disinformation campaigns can be. Clinton's paedophiles, fake news, disinformation. The truth no, matter, um, no longer matters. If we hear a lie in multiple source, it's like we're likely to believe it. And like I was saying, if I was walking down the street and people were telling me the same bit of information, I'm going to soon start believing it. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. I've heard it so many times, it's got to be true. No, why would so many people be lying to me about the same story? Why would so many people be telling me I'm so handsome if I'm not? And that's what it is, is, is that mindset that if everyone's saying it, it's got to be true. The truth and the lies, soon the lines become blurred and you don't know what is fiction and what's fact. So where do we get our information from these days? Just checking the time there. Where it looks like I can waffle, as you can tell. Where do we get our information from these days? So, back in the day, word of mouth. 100 years ago, word of mouth. That then soon turned to print, as in the newspapers and such. And then it was the radio, the wireless, and then moved on to television. And now we're into the digital, digital age, which a lot of people call the new media. It's not new, it's been around for quite some time now. But back in the day, when information was given from, information from a company, given to you via the newspaper and the radio and word of mouth through posters and such. That was the only source of information you could get. Now things are very differently. We are very content heavy. We love information. So where do we get information from now? So global erosion of television newspapers as mainstream information, that majority of our news sources come from the internet, from online sources. Um, Americans, 30% of Americans get all of their information from Facebook alone. It's massive. Controlling the space of information by one company is potentially dangerous. But yeah, we've moved away from print. That's why the newspaper, um, even a standard in London, giving out even a standard or um, selling it, what was it, 25, 30p, whatever it was, they weren't making enough. They weren't selling enough. So what they decided to do is like, we're going to give it away for free. If we're only going to have 200,000 readers um, at 25p, we're going to make X amount of money. If we give it away for free, we're potentially going to get all the commuters. We're potentially going to get short of a million people reading our newspaper. And then what do we do? We sell adverts. We sell our stories. Um, we sell our, we give our paper for free. So people read our stories and see the advertisement and we generate revenue. And that's a very clever way. But press, print and television, tuning into 10 o'clock news or six o'clock news, is very obsolete. It's information is on your phone, in your hand, sat on the toilet, on the bus, uh, waiting for someone, sat on the sofa, flicking through. That's where we get our information these days. 
conventional journalists are no longer the gatekeepers. So what I'm saying there is, like I was saying before, the 10 o'clock news, the 6 o'clock news, the press, that journalists were the guys who, and girls who, who would say, this is information we want you to know. They no longer, they, what they'll do is they filter that information, believe them corrupt or not, um, but they were the gatekeepers. They controlled the information that would go to the masses. Now that doesn't happen. There is no gatekeepers. Through the, the power of social media, the information is out there. It's for anyone to find. It's people like myself um, producing content and just getting it out there on the, um, on the internet. And when it comes to disinformation, that's a very dangerous space. And the fact is that the information is just there for anyone. And anyone can make that information up. No one's fact checking that information that's going out on the internet. So you sat there with your handset. Um, and like saying there, just conventional the personnel. For example, whenever there's a, uh, been a terrorist attack, I don't look to the, the channel, the news for information. I go to uh, Twitter. I go to Facebook. I go to what is going on the ground. The citizen journalists have that information. And you probably see a lot of it. I'm talking a little bit quicker now, so I'm running out of time. But um, a lot of people, you see a lot of times, newspaper stories, BBC, for example, go on Twitter, such and such has said. They relate the, the mainstream news is re relaying information that Johnny with his camera phone, his iPhone, is saying, what is Sarah tweeting? Sarah's tweeted she's seen a little bag on the train with a burning bomb. This is information. Before, it would be a news crew that turns up to get that information. Now it's the citizens journalists who just throw that information out into that space. And as that is a positive, it's also a negative. Because we are content hungry. We want content now. And the fact is, there's so much content out there. Like you're saying, is when you are like Putin, who's trying to disclaim the MH17 thing, just throwing as much content out there that you're trying to decipher what is real, what is not. And it, because we are hungry for content, but at the same time, we're lazy. So let's look at these um, stats and figures here. Social media users, 1.69 billion monthly users on, um, on Facebook, 33 million on Twitter. Have a little read through them. That, imagine now you're a newspaper editor or you're a commissioner for the news, you're the editor of um, Channel 4 News, imagine having broadcast your message to 1.69 million people. Of course, one message wouldn't go to all that people, but as a platform, that is massive. So thinking about it, when you've got so many people online, you've got so many different mainstream media outlets that are fighting for the competition to get these viewers, to get these people in, through the doors. The BBC works very differently in the sense that the BBC through taxpayers and the license fee are funded very differently. Every other media organization out there is funded by shareholders. Well, we've got shareholders, um, it's on the stock market, advertisement. They've got to sell that space of advertisement to get the stories out. So they're targeting their information they give you, the stories they give you to the particular target audience as such to sell adver advertisement space. But now look online, look how many people are there in that forum and companies are fighting for your attention to tell you the stories, to sell you adverts. 5.6 billion searches a day on Google alone, the biggest search engine, and that's 60, um, 63 every second. 63,000 there, 63,000 there, 63,000 there. But a lot of search is going on there. So when news outlets are trying to fight for the top end of Google search for information, if I was to type in now, uh, for example, MH17, uh, Russian attack, bang. Who's going to be fighting up there? Who's paying more money for the space? Who's got more um, traction out there that are going to be sit higher for the information I'm going to get? And it's, it's a big competition within news organizations on what they can tell, what they tell you, what they don't. So personal data as a commodity, I'm going to have to speed this up really now, is all of us as individuals are commodities within data because we are in the sense that these news outlets are through Google search, they're trying to get our attention. So every single one of us is, in di is different. And what's an algorithm? An algorithm is a loads of data points that are put together through a mathematical equation to then be unique to you. So we're all individual algorithms. For example, why some posts get shared on Facebook and others don't as such. So who am I? I'm a white male, age 38, single, I'm a, hono a homeowner, I have a son, I have a dog, a former military guy, voted leave and voted Tory in the last general elections and I work with cameras. It, my interests are, my shopping habits are, people that influence me. Bang. All of them are data points. Every time you go on your phone, you see a cookie, for example. Um, 
is you're building up this al personal algorithm on who you are. So for example, I voted leave and I'm a Tory and I'm white and I'm male. Straight away, what, who's gonna be targeting me with information out there? It's not gonna be the Guardian newspaper or the independent newspaper. It's gonna be more the far right, well not far right, the writer leaning media organizations that are trying to attract me with information because our data is a commodity that everyone wants and these media outlets are fighting for us in that space. So by the information they know about us is what they can target us with information. So if I'm only on Facebook, for example, and all them things are there, they know that, for example, when Dell over there sh shares a video um, that's taking a piss out of Jeremy Corbyn, I'm going to like that. If it's a positive story of Jeremy Corbyn, I'm not going to like that. So not, my algorithm isn't going to share that with me. Before you know it, you live in an echo chamber that they, even though we're surrounded by information, they're only giving us the information that they want us to know. And it can be dangerous in that sense. So we're individual algorithms. Um, Cambridge Analytica is a company that uh, have influenced the Trump campaign and Brexit. They were working with Facebook, taking our information to control the space on how people would likely to vote in certain key elections, which is very dangerous in a sense. Um, hold on. Which is very, it's very dangerous in the sense that they can influence who you are. People like me, they're generally not going to swing or someone who's very left leaning, they're not going to swing. It's the people in the middle that they're like, they're looking for that information to then harvest them with information of Hillary the crook, 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 Trump, 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 Brexit, leave, remain, bus. It's all this information. It's like, whoa, what's going on here? That they were targeting you to say, right, this is who Emil Giesen is. This is his algorithm. This is where he's likely to sway. This is what he liked, what he dislikes. All these data points then influence me with videos, with uh, memes, and all the online content to influence my decision-making skills. Um, even though I think I'm a free citizen and I have the freedom of thought, I clearly don't because I am addicted to my phone. I sit there with my phone. I'm continually online. That My algorithm is giving me information that the company deems important to me and what they believe is or what they think is important to them, because someone's paying them. And like I was saying there, it's all about influencing your political persuasion. So who, what, why, when? So who, who is giving us this disinformation? This, this These are the sort of people that are out there. So it's jokers. So people that are given misinformation could be memes, it could be a joke kind of thing. Um, someone screenshot or something and put it out there. Scammers giving you disinformation, for example, with what's going on um, for long in the UK. Scammers could be like, here's information about how to get um, government funding. Click on this link. It's a scam of disinformation that they've put together to then entice you in. Government's classic for disinformation. Um, foreign agencies. Obviously, we've got the, America, the American election where there's a lot of talk about the Russians influencing in the sense that Clinton and Trump, if the Russians lean in for their political agenda, their foreign policy, Trump's a better candidate for them, they can influence the election through the social media algorithms as such. Conspiracy theorists send in fake information out there, insiders, Chinese whispers, and the media mainstream independence as such. So what's a bot and a troll? So a bot is, is a computer organ. So when it gets information, when you go on Twitter and Facebook and you see this information that's gone out there, it's all this information, boom, 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 is a bot is a computer... Um, algorithm that sends out information on mass. So it could be a tweet, for example, MH17's crash, um, Ukraine fighter jet shot it down. The Russians use bots a lot, and they'll just send so many profiles that send the same information out there that it ranks higher in the algorithm. That is the information that's in the domain because so many people are talking about it. it's trending. Um, it might not be true, but because content that so many people are thrown out there, it starts trending on the net. So before you know it, people start believing it because it's so high in the search engine. A troll's an individual that's spreading information out there. And we all know a troll. They're like little people that live under bridges. So who can I trust? This is the thing. Just remember, what you're seeing and what you're reading is not what's happening. Just stick with us. Don't believe the crap you see from these people. The fake news. Fake news. Just remember. So let's talk about quickly about clickbait. So what clickbait is, is, is like I was saying, is, is a lot of organizations, Daily Mail is a classic for it, it, Mail Online, is they're trying to entice you into a story. It's not even a real good story. It's just a story that gets you in to sell you adverts. And a lot of media outlets are now 
going down this route because it's how they generate um, revenue to keep the, their, their work going. So what is, look at these headings here, must see technology, 15 reasons why you should never support horse racing. Life insurance company hate the new trick. Oh, it's, it's to entice you to go, that's sexy, that's appealing. I've got to read that story. And it's a little shitty little story. What, what were Diana, Proofs of Science, last words? No one knows, but the story, I'm going to click on it. Because once again, like I was saying earlier about the fake news being that Donna Kebab, it's tasty. Well, what is that? The real news, I'm not really, not really interested. Let me see what's going on here. Cabin crews um, take secret pictures. You won't believe the results. Oh, I won't. Let me click on that. Clickbait. It's to entice you into a story. And it's not a, it's not a newsworthy story, generally. So be aware of them. Deep fakes. These are artificial intelligence and very dangerous. Um, they're still in the early days, but they're moving forward. Is where computer generating is you can manipulate some uh, influential person, like a politician, on what they're saying. And the fact is, the way we share information online, going, oh, I'm going to share that, is very dangerous. The fact is that people believe what they see. So have a look at this. And this is how dangerous it is. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, I don't know, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would, someone, Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. It's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. They sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopian. Thank you. Stay woke, bitches. So you see how dangerous that is? The fact is, if you can manipulate the wording of a politician, a leader, and spread that information around the world, imagine now that a video like that, very similar, of Trump was spread around, for example, Syria. Talking to Syria, um, and it was spread about, they're going to bomb, there's going to be a bombing campaign. Um, they hate Muslims, they're going to kill everyone. Imagine the people that aren't privy to the the reams of information, just seeing that snippet, how you can influence someone's opinion and the fear factor. So we're moving into a space now where it's very dangerous through deep fakes. Look at this, The Rock. Everyone loves The Rock. This is me here, this one here. So what I've done is I've, an app, £4.99. What I've done is I got signed up to it, took a, pic, a video of myself, and all they've done through artificial intelligence matched me up. That is a picture of me that's morphed into The Rock. Pretty similar, I reckon. I reckon I could pull it off. Um, and that's a shitty little app. Imagine having software that can, like we've seen in that previous video, controlling that. And then obviously the voice recognition to control that is a very dangerous space with deepfakes. So look out for them and check your sources. But right, the rock. Top tips for fact checking information then. Identify the source who is sharing it. It's, it's a massive one here. Who is promoting the information? Is it for their own beliefs? Is it a far right group that's throwing their information out there about Muslims? We hate Muslims. They're coming over here stealing our jobs. The police are taking our jobs. Who is sharing it? Is the person, the profile that's sharing this information, is he renowned for this? Is it a Russian bot? Is looking at the, the, the profile, is there actual profile picture of a person? When was the last time they shared a personal picture? Is it just a made up account and what they're trying to do, what they, how they're trying to influence me. Um, and so there, look at the profile. And you can't say this, it's just one, this is enough. You check the profile out. Um, we all know the person that comments all the time who hides behind um, a random picture, but there are some profiles where people just do that. They're generally called the trolls. And, but there's other times it's just a bot. There's no information really substance to that, um, that, that profile, but they're sending content out there. Be aware. Keyword search, for example, if something happens like uh, blah, 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 the Queen got run over today. So the Queen, I've heard the information that the Queen Elizabeth, God rest her soul, well, she's not even dead yet, but um, imagine the Queen had been hit by a car. First thing I do, go to Google, Queen hit car. 
keyword search, see what information comes up, see how much is in the public space or domain. She's not likely to get hit by a car. Read the comments. The amount of time where something's been shared around and I've just looked at it and just read the comments, you see fake news, this is fake. People talking about it. Generally, people will pick up on this and they will start spreading that it's fake. People like calling other people out. So don't just see something and share it. Read the comments below it. See what's going on. See what the content really is. Is it likely to be true? And I don't want to get into the argument that people are stupid, but we all know stupid people, yeah? And is this going to be true? Is this story so stupid that ugh, that can't be real? We all know someone who's on Facebook and Twitter that shares everything. It's normally your nan. She's just like, oh, it's got to be true. Share. It's like, what are you doing, nan? That's fake. Um, it's check. Is it going to like to be real? And Google search. Just check online. Clearly, not everyone's got the time to do all this every time you scroll through something. But this is where a little bit of common sense comes through. And if you're looking for something particularly, um, like conflict um, stories and stuff, check the source. Who's sharing it? What they're likely to achieve? What is their agenda? And reverse image search. Can't stress this one enough. Um, I'll talk about it in a second. Here's a good website. It's just checking full facts. Go into there, put in a story or fact, and it will check to the sources. Top tips for um, reverse Google search. This is a classic one. I use this daily. Look at this picture. It's an actual video. There's loads of Pakistani men in London jumping around cheering. Read the headline there. Oh, look, a crowd of moderate Muslims celebrating the Paris attack in London. Straight away, me, if I'm slightly leaning towards disliking of Pakistani young men, uh, Muslims, because the rhetoric has been, I'm like to believe that looking at the source of who it is, um, Britain first, I'm like to go, yeah, share. Before I know it, I'm spreading that information, that misinformation. By taking a bit of um, that video, put it into Google reverse, or a picture or a video, it pops up that these young Pakistani men jumping around the, sh the streets aren't celebrating the Paris terror attack in London. They're celebrating Pakistan winning the cricket. And it's that bit of information that someone takes and goes, I like that video. I'm going to share it as disinformation by throwing it out there, by changing the narrative. That's not a cricket um, celebration. They're supporting the terrorist attack in Paris to strike that emotion amongst people and um, to get more views, controlling um, the influence. Look at this one here. There's another post discussing, um, I can't even read it. Uh, discussing sponging off our taxes, giving the finger to the press, shameful. Why, what, um, share if you think we should get rid of the royal family. Prince William told the media to fuck off when asked about Kate, sticking his finger up. Bloody good old Willie there. What's he doing, sticking his finger up at the press? I've now shared that picture. So anyone who's anti royal is likely to share that because they believe in the narrative that's been shared. They don't care if it's true or not. But then you're looking at it from a different angle, another picture, he's showing three fingers. He's not swearing, as we're seeing there. It's, it's people taking information to suit their narrative. You need to be very careful what people are sharing. It's another classic one, the killing of the Iranian general. Um, if you look on the left-hand side, you've got this footage, this actual footage of them shooting. A Turkish news station um, shared the footage to say that was a convoy he was in when he was shot. That is footage that was taken from a computer game. It's shared by a Turkish um, TV channel. Look at this footage of where he is. Also, look at a picture of him. If I was to tell you now, um, Qasem Soleimani is an evil Iranian terrorist. Look at that picture. You'd think, yeah, he looks like a terrorist, don't you? If I was now to say to you he was a nice Iranian general who supported the Middle East, saved millions of Muslims and people across the area, look at that picture now. You'd be like, hmm, actually, yeah, he looks all right. The difference in influence of a picture simple as that and even when i'm sharing stories i look online to get a picture to reflect the narrative i'm trying to put across we all do it evil guy nice guy as easy as that manipulation of the information that's given to us here's another quick one is the question was do question was given out do you have sympathy for people who leave the uk to join um, fighters in syria this was given out by the sun before you know you got a headline of one in five brit muslims sympathize with jihadists that wasn't a question that was asked that's manipulation of the information by spreading um, disinformation. One in five British Muslims didn't say um, in their statistics support jihadis. It was, do you have sympathy for people who leave the UK to join fighters in Syria? That could be fighters who are fighting for, with Assad against the terrorists. It could be fighters that are joining the Free Syrian Army. It could be fighters that are going off to join the Kurdish forces. It's a loaded question. 
that they have manipulated the truth to make a headline one in five Brits and uh, Muslims, which is not true. This is one I put on the Instagram is do you trust mainstream news um, outlets and journalists? So what I put it up there, we don't know how many people voted in this one. Actually, we just see the headline one in five. Put this one up here. This is on my Instagram. And so I could then put the headline 86 percent of people in the UK don't trust mainstream journalists. That's a, it's not mis, it's not disinformation. In my poll that I done, I'm not telling you how many people voted in it, but 86 percent of the people that did vote don't trust mainstream journalists. I've even changed the word in slightly there. It's the manipulation to massage the truth to make a headline more more sexy for you as the punter, the consumer, to want to engage with it. Um, we're running massively out of time now, so what I'll do is talk briefly now on COVID nineteen. Is we're now living in another space of COVID-19, uh, of disinformation, the propaganda war between America um, the, and China and every other country in between is the 5G network. We've, we've all heard stories, or the hoax stories, the conspiracy theorists on 5G. And people probably listen to this now going, you're talking shit, Emil, 5G is linked to corona. There's no evidence. I'd love to see your evidence as such. However, people burning down masks, people um, getting aggressive with government um, um, out wanting to bring the 5G in, is by, as conspiracy theorists and as countries and organisations trying to manipulate the truth against the rhetoric against China, is some people are linking 5G to corona as such. And it's once again, we're in that space of disinformation, is what is true and what is not when it comes to corona. Um, is Trump saying this, the Chinese saying that. And we know when it comes to Corona, it's the Chinese are masters of manipulation, they're masters of disinformation, and they're masters of censorship. When the information that comes out of China generally is not true. The control that they have of their people. Living in a, in a democracy like we do is we have so much information, but we don't know what's true and what's not because we have so much. That countries like Iran, China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, where it's very controlled, the media information that's given out there, is, is it the truth from the government or is it not? Um, is it good to have more sources potentially to think about it or is it better to have limited? It's, it's that question. And also it comes to the narrative on COVID-19 when you talk about, everyone's got a different opinion on what's going on with um, NHS and like we all stand there with Thursday, people are going to stand, stand outside clapping the NHS tonight at 20 hundred, banging their pans. However, some people be like, NHS, what are they on about? All they're doing is TikTok videos. We've all seen the TikTok videos of them dancing around. I, I love nurses dancing around. Send them to me. I love them. Yeah. But some people be like, there obviously is not a massive campaign against um, Corona here if all the nurses and doctors are busy doing that and the police officers. So some people will be sharing this to get their narrative across, their beliefs that there isn't a, a national crisis going on because the nurses are dancing around. But other people, on the other hand, We'll be sharing pictures like this to go to strike that emotion amongst you to go look at the nurses. This could be a woman stood in a door. She could be in her house, for example. We don't know how true this is. And it's there shared within the Internet to show that she's been working hard all day, that this is serious. It's to suit someone's narrative. She could be sat. Uh, that door could be a bathroom door and a husband took that picture for all we know. So we need to be very careful on the sources of information. And also the mainstream is... It is the dying breed, the mainstream. And I would turn around and people ask me all the time because I'm mostly independent. What do I think of the mainstream? And I have a lot of time for the mainstream information is because news channels. Yes, of course, they have an agenda. They also have uh, a political message they want to get across. But at the same time, if we don't have mainstream organizations that hold in governments accountable, we don't have any. We have a, we have a totalitarian system of where the government controls the narrative, and we cannot allow a government to control a narrative. We need organisations to hold them accountable for their actions. So, personally, my view is that we need to have these large um, media outlets mainstream. However, they need to be more transparent with their information and less, because obviously it's funding, less so um, agenda driven. So. Out of everything that's saying there, I've run out of massive time there, so apologies. Um, what I would say is the classic thing is check it before you share it. Don't be, don't be um, your nan who's sharing that information. Check the source, see what it is and go, what is the message they're trying to get out there? And if it's too good to be true, it generally is. But definitely with Google Reverse um, or Tin Eyes, another um, company online, chuck your picture in there and it will tell you all the sources that, where that picture's been used. But check it before you share it. 
Any questions, Dunks? Thanks, Emil. Um, I enjoyed that, mate. It was uh, really well put together. Um, I'm just going to read a few of the questions. I know we're short of time, um, but I think a few of you maybe have answered um, during your presentation anyway, but I'll get you to, to reiterate a few of the points. Um, first one's through, uh, from one of the alumni, actually, and Giles. Um, given the effectiveness and of disinformation and malinformation, fake news and lies, and the audience apathy towards the determination of truth in current times, what hope do you hold for the integrity and security affairs going forward? Are all consigned to join the propaganda wars to succeed? As security consultants, we are often briefing the client on ways to control the narrative for crisis response. But what danger is there? The ethos creeps into the way we all do our parts of the business. What hope to re reward integrity? Are you reading a book to me here? I know, mate. Good question. Big question. Big question is okay. I thought you were reading a novel there. So, what, so in a nutshell, what is it playing within the, the risk sector? Yeah, for, for, for a security consultant. Sort of. Yeah. This is the thing is because there's so much information out there as a security risk consultant and you're sharing that information to clients, you need to be on the ball with your information. You need to have the facts that you're sharing out there. And it, it comes down to what, like I was saying there, it's fact checking time after time after time. And I've fallen foul of it and I hold my hands up of falling foul to fake news. And it's, it's a dangerous game. It's because people out there will manipulate the information that you're given or the information that you're, you're trying to give out there. Is, it's, it's a dangerous one, especially when you've got client-based and you're working in the risk sector, when you're, especially around the world where you've got certain governments and organizations that are trying to manipulate the truth and you potentially could be sending clients or yourself to them regions. You need to be very careful on the information there. Do I hold hope that that's gonna change? I think the more accessible internet, the more information is going to be there, the more space there's going to be there, the more disinformation we're going to get. And I don't think, unless governments are held accountable for fake news and media organisations are held more accountable, I think we're just going to continue going the way we are. Yes, yeah, an interesting point. I, I did notice um, uh, Twitter uh, uh, put something out yesterday concerning um, sort of COVID-19 mm. fake news, how they're going to try and obviously... Yeah, no, that's a good one, actually. Good point there. I'm um, sorry to interrupt. It's about... Governments have been trying to hold companies like Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp accountable for fake news. It's who, where does the line stop? Who, you're, the, you're, the, you're the owner of this platform. You control what's going on. They can't control everything. But it's like WhatsApp. If a message has been shared X amount of times, it's limiting the amount of times you can then reshare it again. It's stopping that spread of massive information. Um, we, we've all, we're all in WhatsApp groups, aren't we? We've all got that idiot in the WhatsApp group that will share anything. And it's like, oh, why are you sharing this shit? But some people actually believe it. So by controlling the amount of people you can share it, to, it's like the corona, the spread of the corona, the R number. If you can control the amount of people that get that information, the less disinformation is getting circulated out there. Good point. Um, you mentioned it before in, in your presentation, actually, on, on how to in, ensure your... Your information that you're getting from social media is credible. Um, can you elaborate on any of that? Well, what else you do? You're looking at sort of a number of different sources for the same information, or yeah, it's obviously Middle East. I, um, I've taken my, my focus off the Middle East recently, actually. But before the Middle East was uh, very pertinent to me in a sense, what was going on in Syria, and it was checking sources. For example. Uh, who's sharing it? Like I was saying, what is their message? So I'd go into a picture, for example, New York Times will send, show a picture of something that's going on in Syria. And I'd go, okay, well, I know New York Times probably aren't in that area of Syria. So where are they getting that information from? I then look at the byline. So who's written the story? What is their other stories they've written? Obviously, if you go in depth, this is. Um, what other stories have they written? What, where do they politically lean? So who are they likely to be supporting in the campaign? I go as much into the byline on the photo. Who's taking that photo, which is generally going to be in somewhere like Syria, it'll be a local um, journalist, a local, local photographer. Who is this guy? Right, Abraham Muhammad. Let me check him on, um, I was about to say Tinder. He's not on Tinder. He, he's on Twitter. So I'm checking on um, Twitter. Who is this guy? What other pictures has he shared? What is his political persuasion? What likely is this agenda? It's just looking into the facts, going in between the weeds. Um, like organized, It's open source searching. It's checking who's what, what they're saying, what they've said before, and what they like to say again. It's getting in there, but it's time consuming. And, that, and that's the problem you've got, is it takes a lot of time to check what's real and what's not. Yeah, I agree, it's a lengthy process. Um, I'm just gonna finish with one last question, and it's, uh, it's a part of the question that someone sent in, so I won't read you the full paragraph. Um, but in your opinion, has social media had a positive or negative impact on journalism? I think it's, 
as I'm not a, a, a journalist as per, per se, I would say, if I was a mainstream journalist, I would definitely say it's got a negative. It's the fact is that any, everyone now is a citizen journalist. Before, as a journalist who worked for a broad, uh, broadsheet, I control the narrative that goes out to you. Now, all of a sudden, we've got people like Emil Giesel, and we've got people like Sam Humphreys over there. We've got people over there who are now passing that information out. It's competition to control that space. Before, is journalists are now very uncredible in a sense. It's not my opinion. That's what I'm getting from speaking to people. Is people don't trust journalists anymore. And it's, it's a shame because I think it comes down to the Trump campaign, which has been a massive, heavily fake news story that whenever a journalist questions what, he, what he's trying to say, he shuts them down with fake news. You're fake news. I don't need to listen to what you're saying. Is Well, listen to their, their question. So I think because that rhetoric's been passed around and it's been repetitive time after time, like you're saying, now it's instilled into us that journalists are all liars. Why would I trust a journalist? They've always had that, that reputation as such. Um, and I think it's really bad that social media has taken over the domain that yeah it's good that the fact is that anyone can share the information that it's not controlled to certain entities but really at the moment as i can imagine a mainstream journalist is pretty pe pulling out the hair because social media has taken over really and um, even like looking at this tiger king joe exotic launches 2020 president campaign from prison that's fake news that is a shitty meme that's been put together uh, on an app and I can even tell just by the way it's been, I can tell by looking at the right hand side, the way it's been cut as a picture, it's cutting out the brand of the logo. So I know straight away from looking at it from experience, that's a fake um, story. But how many people would probably have to Google that to check if that was real or not? Because I did yesterday. I saw that and quickly had to check, go, is that true or not? And that's what the way the world we live in, we have to question everything. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Jamil. I think we'll have to uh, cut it off there. I know we've gone a little bit over time, but that was a uh, yeah, really interesting presentation. I'll bet to spend your time, though. Yeah, not, not, not a better way. Um, so just a, as a look forward, um, next Thursday, um, we have Lindsay talking about uh, where you can look at a bit more about your sort of personal well-being. One for you as well there, Geese, um, on boosting your immune system. <laughs> a little bit different. Um, what is it? Really Boost your immune system. Yeah, so look, look forward to that one next Thursday. And then just a final point before I do um, cut, cut off. Um, of our own uh, Pete Lawrence and former alum, um, SMC student Leon Cook are both going at it. Marines v Paras next week on a seven day fast and fizz challenge. Um, so keep an eye on our social media to see how they get along with that. Um, hopefully they'll survive. Thanks again. Um, hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, thank you. See you all soon. Cheers, Mill. Cheers, Duncan. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Much appreciated.